welcome you all back to another episode of Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. This happens to be an anniversary show because it's our 200th show already. And we have that is, uh, together. That is magnificent. It, it is. And that was uh, one of our three uh, most proven um, panelists here. And that was Yu Soto from Bishop Museum Hello. back in Honolulu, Hawaii. Hello again. Yeah. And uh, the other location we have is Long Beach, California, with uh, Ron Lindgren from there. Hi, Ron. Hi, uh, I'm in the middle of a hot spell where my acquaintances out of Palm Springs are enjoying a sort of heady 120 degree weather. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. And I, I can't quite compete with that, but uh, still back in supposedly temperate Germany, uh, broadcasting from the city of Würzburg, it's finally getting summer here and, and also somewhere in nearly as, not nearly as close as to yours, but pretty comfortably warm here. So, so again, uh, this is human human architecture. And wouldn't you think that for such a special event, you would maybe show the best piece of architecture that there is in Hawaii, but uh, we have to disappoint you sort of, because we have already done that in the past 200 shows or 199 shows, <laughs> both the best work from the past, which you have been creating, a significant part of that, Ron, with uh, your business partner, Edward Killingsworth and Larry Stricker, and also the ones from the present we find promising. But, you know, other than that, we still have to say, you know, if, you know, considering how much we talk, uh, maybe more should have happened. So I, this shouldn't sound like resignation, but um, we thought maybe we try a different angle and maybe try to approach architecture from where we can get the audience uh, relate to it better. And for the longest time, we've been using already automobiles as vehicles for thought. So at some point we thought we dedicated an entire show or a massive series to that. So this is volume five of it here now. And if we can get the first slide up here, it basically is uh, another sort of subtitle or topic um, which is um, uh, talking about um, the aspect of loyalty. And, and this is also a dedicate the show to my son, Lenny, whose uh, 24th birthday it was last week. And I drove up to him via train uh, a couple of days ago. And uh, he, um, I shouldn't say surprised me anymore because for the last six years that he had his driver's license, um, he was uh, basically surprising me uh, or not anymore, because ever since he had been staying loyal to this one model, which we ended last show with Citrons, which our family has a affiliation to because of the De Chavo and the Ugly Duck without, I wouldn't be. And Larry basically stayed yeah. true to that brand and bought himself a Citroen that Citroen calls DS. And that sounds familiar to us because it's kind of a remake but not of a style of a car but reusing or remembering sort of a brand name and and the the the, the that the top left the white one was the first one he bought and then the one next to it a uh, number two is the one that he came out of the bushes with literally and figuratively speaking day before yesterday and uh, we want you <laughs> the audience again to think um, there are certain things when you do them the first time, they're most memorable. So your first love, right? You will never forget your first love. And also somehow your first, you know, your first, your children. I, I have to say that isn't just your first child, but every child you have seems to be the first child. And, you know, you remember most vividly. And, and Lenny basically was born uh, around uh, the year that I built uh, the first kindergarten and, and somehow, you know, I was always on alert. I drove there with a car and I was, um, you know, I was always on alert, you know, would he, would it be time and would I need to have to rush back? And again, uh, Larry and Joey, they saved all their money from family, you know, holidays and, um, and, and birthdays and, and Christmases and stuff to buy their first car. And, and he bought that. And, and the point is he still, staying true and loyal. So loyalty, do we have loyalty in architecture as much? And to Ron, I would say we've been talking about the case study houses at the Eichler homes, right? And probably if you ever owned an Eichler home, you always want to keep owning one, right? But with cars, I think 
I find this sort of rather unique, again, sort of Lenny's way, and especially as such a young guy where there's uh, like all the options out there. He's basically very much committed to, to that one thing. So loyalty is something we want you guys to think about. How loyal are you to your house, your first house or whatever house, right? Is there the same relationship? That's one of the things. Again, we're less than ever sort of providing answers to you, but basically raising questions. So um, maybe yeah, and I think that that's slide. a very, I think that's a very good thing to bring up that the loyalty to a brand or a make of automobile is far likely to occur than to the loyalty of any type of particular architecture, house, or anything that has to do with living versus, you know, your habitation versus your car. Yeah, yeah. No, and if we get to the next slides, the other topic uh, we want, the other point we want to make, what you all think about, what's the first car you ever drove, right? In America, obviously, that's why, you know, you know, for kids, uh, German kids, it's unimaginable that you can drive, you know, earlier than you can in Germany and driver's license are cheaper and, um, you know, easier to get. And that's what I experienced when I went there. Uh, during college where I, you know, also made my American driver's license. But in, in either way, it's like it, nothing beats this excitement when you're most likely, you know, it's still in a sort of a gender loaded culture when you're, when your dad's mostly right, allowed you to drive the first time. And this is the car that Joey and Lenny started uh, illegally and, and, and other following <laughs> generations, actually the, Bonus son of my best German buddy, our Tiki basement expert, Stefan Malta, he learned to drive in that car all illegally before they were ready for the, the kind of the official training. So they will never forget. And, and this car is a, is a Renault Twingo, so another French manufacturer. This car is a quarter of a century years young. And uh, thanks to Stefan's mechanic, who has always kept it alive and like, you know, closing one or a couple more eyes of all the little things that happen here and there. And now it's our exotic escapism uh, ex expert, Susanna's uh, childhood friend, uh, basically, who, uh, Marcus, who keeps the Twingo on the road. And, and that car is just an amazing survivor. You know, it's, it's old and it's always been beaten. It's never gotten taken care of. It used to be our construction supervision car and every intern kind of drove the heck out of it. And you, I mean, you probably can never get a softer, more wobbly transmission there, the gears, you know, <laughs> but it's but it's still up and running. And so um, that that's something that here in the city of Würzburg is actually a, a university town. And this seems to be the so the retirement headquarters of the Twingos, because almost like felt every fourth car seems to be like a Twingo. And that's because why? Because they are so affordable. And then they are so reliable. And that's something, Ron, we discussed before the show that, you know, you said even other subjects like the heat you're going through, right? Rich people are able to, to handle it, right? And basically just crank up the AC. But the little people, you know, less than, than ever. And, and so that, that's, a, mm -hmm. that's both in architecture and in, in the automotive realm, the question of affordability and reliability um, is an increasing run, right? Yeah, and also the, the more of them there are, the easier and cheaper they are to fix. So if there are tons of them all over the place, mechanics are going to be able to fix them. That is an advantage that you do not have if you have a very expensive one-of-a-kind car that nobody can fix where you live. So if it's Twingo Town, then that's a good thing for all the people who have them. But, you know, yeah, yeah. Before, when, before we went on the air, one of the things that I was saying to Ron was, Neither he nor I are familiar with these two makes of cars because they're not sold in the United States. They were in the past, in the distant past, but they haven't been for a long time. And yet yeah. there are a lot of similarities that we're about to get into, and I think in the next slide, that are applicable not only to cars, but architecture in that all of those are made to accommodate humans. They're made by people to accommodate people. They're the right size for people. They're things are within reach. We create mm -hmm. things for our human bodies to be able to live in and drive around in. Yeah, yeah. 
And to just let you know what's the reason behind a couple of the pictures here, the one number nine at the bottom right is one that Joey basically took somewhere. And this is funny, right? Because that Twingo obviously wanted, seems like it wanted to go to Hawaii, but as you guys said, it never <laughs> made it there, right? In, in no, the middle, the, the middle number eight is recently where, uh, you know, Joey and Lenny stopped by and you see then uh, Lenny's DS that we just showcased and you see how large it is, although it's a small compact car as well compared to the Twingo. And at the very bottom, yeah. you see Joey and his wasn't his first car, but his, you know, basically his, his first new car that um, his family supported him with was an A1. And that's for the Audi fans of us, which you, Ron, are one and I am. But that model you've never seen. And this is weird because it is a very great car. It's a small car. It's it's the entry level Audi that is, you know, by now there, there were times where people with all their big Ram pickup trucks and stuff were afraid of small cars. But, you know, that has eased a little bit in people. You even see smart cars on the road. So this is this is way bigger and it's way bigger than the Twingo. But also one point we want to come up with, and that's at the top left, uh, the cute little frog up there is basically, despite some really bad postmodernism that we want, don't want to get into or even talk about where architects made you know, buildings look like other things. But in, in cars, there is this sort of impersonation. And, and all our kids, all of our kids basically call the Twingo the frog. And if you look at the front end, there's little doubt why that is, right? <laughs> pretty much and and we and we also talked about a couple of times we shouldn't talk about architecture without crediting the architects so we shouldn't talk about cars without crediting uh the 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 designers although not naming them all the time but actually um you know ironically or intuitively um, um lenny and i found out through research for the show that actually the designer of the twingo and his ds is actually the same guy so that is that is rather mm -hmm. interesting and oh, another thing, yeah. so we should we should encourage you guys to do your own investigations and research because you can find out strange things, and that gets us to the next slide. Because um, for and I let you guys talk about that. So let's go to the next slide and 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 you tell you know what we discovered here recently. Well, you're talking about the this multi-use interior yeah. here. Yeah, 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 yeah. We that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the thing that struck me is that, as I said earlier, cars, just like houses and other architecture, are made to accommodate human bodies. Now, a car is like a little house or a little room that can be driven around. It's like a little piece of architecture. But unlike where you live, everything is built into it. So you don't get to move the furniture around the way you would in an apartment or a hall. Everything is attached to the floor because it has to be for safety. Yet, you can accommodate a lot of movement and a lot of changes, even with the restrictions of all these built-in features. So this shows how you can either have the back seat pushed up so that there's room for things to be put in the back, or you can actually put the back seat down and lie down. So a car can accommodate things the way, as you see in the lower picture on the right, a, a tiny house can. A tiny house is kind of comparable to a car in that you live in it, but it has to be small and it has to be designed specifically to be as efficient as possible, as we see in the car interiors that we see the different uh, configurations of. Yeah, yeah, and I might I might say that uh, in the United States, especially today, there are two groups of people who are taking that idea of living in their vehicle or living in their cars. Uh, th that first group were those uh, after the 2008 recession who lost their homes uh, and actually went out on the road and became uh, urban nomads. Uh, their situation has been uh, celebrated in that Oscar winning movie Nomadland that just uh, came out a few months ago. But a less fortunate group, unfortunately living in their cars, are those who have lost their jobs in the pandemic. They are getting pandemic relief checks, but they're using them to buy old cars or old RVs. And they and their families are trying to make a life in these vehicles. Yeah, and yeah. absolutely. And, and, I, and for people that, like the, that, that the, the tiny house, for people like that, that's what the entire tiny house concept is, or little house in which, 
you can move people, hopefully, either off the streets or out of their cars into a house. But the house, again, is going to have some features that are going to be comparable to the interior of a car. Yeah. And so the three terms we want to throw out to adopt to architecture is obviously versatility, is durability, and transformability. And so the, yeah. what you pointed out at the bottom right, this is the floor prints um, of the, the office home, which you can uh, insert very strategically, very you know, uh, little um, additional walls, which are the black lines, the thicker black lines. And you can basically transform it into um, three individual um, parts of the house that you can that you can rent out because you know when you know shit happens and recession again or divorces and stuff like that, you don't need to sell the entire house. Yeah, you, you can rent out certain parts of it, and and that's like the same which we try to illustrate with a car. You know, when here when you need to uh, you know go and buy more in bulk, you can actually have very easily have the rear bench slide towards the front on a track and make yourself more, um, more, more track room and then a little less passenger room, but there's still a lot, which is surprising for such a small car. And then again, as you know, I was, when I was being, trying to be lazy and not go out and take a picture of our own car, I was sort of Googling for that. And I found a picture where it was all flat, where the front seats basically are pushed all the way to the front and the, the back of it back and, and the same with a with a back seat and you make it into a bed that Suzanne is demonstrating here. And and there again, you know, <laughs> if you're thinking about the students here in town, they're students, they don't have a lot of money and they can afford that little car and not more. And when they're on the on a trip, they might not even be, be afford a hotel or even an Airbnb or whatever, right? So they want to just might just want to crash in the car. So, so that's something that, that again, the Twingo, and I want to put this into the context of time because I also in the previous picture, we don't need to go back, but you guys saw the Ugly Duck again. And the Ugly Duck was discontinued in the early 90s. And this one here started in the early 90s. So at, thinking about it in many ways, I think it's the successor of, of the Citroen de Chevaux. And again, being mm -hmm. this very, very basic car. And again, to that extent, obviously family tradition. Uh, go to the next slide. We're still here. We want you, the audience, to think about what was our first car. And my first car, we are going to share what our first cars were, and I start out here, was actually my mother's car. You see her uh, on the picture number two up there, standing uh, next to my sister, and my sister is in front of her car. And that's you guys, that sounds, again, very exotic to you guys, because this is an Alto Bianchi. And this is uh, the, the <laughs> Italian version of the Mini Cooper, the original Mini Cooper, very small oh, yeah. car. Yeah. Uh, there's also like, uh, you know, we guys, I, I, I was a sandbox, you know, miniature car uh, nut kid that loved to do that. But the, the one at the top right, I wasn't supposed to touch because that's one by my mother who has the miniature version of that one. And she always kept it at a safe place. So I wouldn't ruin it in the sandbox. And I'm the beneficiary of that now because otherwise I would be gone by now. And my father kind of took a picture of that one. And she had this sort of mustard colored ones. And then the blue one was actually the one that she had after that, that she gave to me. And that was, was um, um, I, I, you know, uh, Ron, you've been talking, I mean, Eric Bricker, who's going to do the movie about Ed Killingsworth and you guys, you know, was, uh, lives in Texas and had this horrible situation not that long ago about this, you know, other extreme of temperatures being low where it usually doesn't happen and water pipes bursting and stuff like that. Besides these sort of more rare and unusual events, you know, houses are still pretty sort of safe. While cars by their nature, you know, is, is a lot of mass that needs to be moved and, you know, and the technology needed to make, make that happen basically. And also cars by moving, are vulnerable to be hit or hit something, right? And I, you know, mm -hmm. this is the car that I, it was my first car, but what, you know, I really uh, worked it hard. I, I, I got off the road on a trip back to my army base and, uh, you know, got on, 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 on an over ice bridge 
um, I basically, we, my, my, my first wife, we got on a farm, we got stuck and the tractor pulled us out, but didn't put the chain to the frame, but to the hood and pulled the hood out. And I banged it back in with a sledgehammer. <laughs> And the most spectacular for you guys is when we were all butterflies in our stomachs and we're thinking we needed to kiss each other. That was when we got close to, a, to an <laughs> intersection and we ran into the guy in front of us. So, um, but I have to say the very little small picture in there, the, the red one, I want to um, thank a guy who basically bought it. And he was the brother, the little brother of a classmate of mine, Dietmar Schapa, and he brought it back to original pristine condition and he painted it Ferrari red as you can see there and these cars are an absolute rarity they were pretty rare back then but now they're absolutely I, I don't think I ever seen one ever in the last couple of years anywhere in Germany anymore and 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 Lenny here many years ago is posing next to one of the few ones we found on the road and that was one that parked next to our conversion of this apartment building the Pilk apartment building where and, and this particular model was actually the Abarth. And the Abarth we know now from the Chick Pocentos, the new, the retro of the Fiat 500. These are the hot rod machines, the ones with the more horsepower. And that one had, had one like that. And the Italians call it the flying coffin because it was so light and you know, <laughs> relatively to that much horsepower, which was only 70, which sounds ridiculous, but the car was so light. So again, a similar kind of an approach regarding our remodeling of the Pilka apartments, sort of like a hot rodding, like enhancing yeah. certain aspects of it. So here there's this thing, you know, the popping out of the hood, which is the, the kind of the hot rod thing. So, so again, you, the audience, think <laughs> about your first car and the first architecture you were exposed to and think about, do you have same feelings? Do you have same f attitudes? And what are similarities and what are differences? Okay, and Martin, so, yeah. And Martin, when you uh, were mentioning automobile accidents, that sort of pinged something in my brain, rather dispiriting uh, statistics for the United States. From 1899 until this very year, over 3.8 million Americans have been killed, five to six times more than that injured. And even today, uh, automobile fatalities as an average each year run a little bit more than 36,000 people lost. Absolutely. And, and, and that basically, yeah. And that gets us to the next slide because that has to do with your first car, DeSoto. Oh, it certainly does. And this is a picture of me with my first car in the upper right, which was a 1971 Volkswagen Super Beetle that got imported all the way from Germany to the island of Oahu. But I wasn't the only one who had a Volkswagen Beetle in those days because they were very popular here. There were lots of cars. There were lots of Volkswagens here. And you were saying that you saw the, seemed like every fourth car was a Twingo in the college town. Almost practically every fourth or fifth car here was a Volkswagen Beetle. And they started being imported here in the 1950s and into the 1970s. There were lots of them. But my car, speaking of car crashes, uh, met its end very spectacularly, and you can see a little picture of it in the middle of the top row of pictures here because it got flipped on the H1 freeway in 1978, and that was the end of it. It was not the end of me because I was wearing my three-point seatbelt with a shoulder harness. Very few people did in those days, but that's why I survived. That's why I'm alive today to be able to talk about it. Thank and you. one of the things... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Seatbelt. <laughs> but one thing I think that we can mention, too, is um, which we'll, we'll talk about in, in the next slide, which we probably won't get to until our next, our next show. But the styling of the Beetle, um, one of the reasons it stood out so much in those years was because it was a very old design from the 1930s. So by the time the Beetles were becoming really popular in the United States and worldwide, they were already a very old design. But that is another whole topic of design in the 1930s, streamlining, et cetera, which we'll get into at another point. Yeah, and since you invited us, we still made it to that next slide, so we're on at DeSoto. And I think you're making it a good point okay. because, again, the most darkest figure of my culture from the past, Hitler was the inventor of the Käfer, how it's called, and Käfer means beetle. 
and again, you know, you don't need to have much imagination again if you call it Twingo or Frog, why you call the 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 VW, you know, the, the bug, the kefa, the beetle. Um, but right. um you you um luckily thanks to you guys, that darkest era didn't last it lasted long enough, too long, but you ended it at some point, luckily. And so um after that, uh, you know, no one hardly ever remembers the the car. Uh, you know, for for that origin, it, it almost flipped its meaning, right? Uh, 180 degrees. But there's yeah. also one thing, again, comparing architecture and automobiles and climates, you probably, again, could have been rolling down your still cranked equipped uh, windows um, and basically cruising the island without anything else. And if you guys are more interested, we actually, the, 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 the picture from your legendary accident that made it to the title page of the, the, the paper news, uh, we dedicated an entire show to the comparison of, of VWs uh, in Hawaii. And we, we called it air-cooled architecture and air-cooled automobiles because that's right. what they are. Right. And so you could have used, you know, obviously the, the trade winds to cool your engine, obviously, and also cool yourself, just keep the window open. Where they come from, which is here, not so much because this is temperate climate and it's either damn hot like now or it's it's really crazy cool. And so you see at the top, my mother in her hometown standing in front of one that they use for an ice skating rank to basically scrape the snow and the ice off at times. And you can see how it's starting to get really rusted and they put this sort of rad, uh, you know, desperate kind of attempt to keep it away from, from rusting, put this kind of rust proof stuff on. And the other one picture at the very bottom right there is basically my mother again and my sister, because something you share, the Soto, is that both your first cars were beetles, were bugs. And, and here it is. Yeah. And again, here's the poster yeah. that you uh, contributed at the bottom left, Kade F. Uh, that is the origination of it that we sort of, again, luckily, don't have to remember every day, but we should also never forget because that's right. what it was. And and next time, and we certainly maybe we we bring up the next slide, but this one we really will start out to talk about in in, in the next week is basically that well, there's also the other side of Germany, which is the east side, which was the former GDR, and um, they had um, certainly a very very different. The circumstances, although we said no, both were dictatorships. One lasted again, thanks to you. You know, it lasted too long, but thanks to you, it lasted not longer. But this one here lasted like what, like four times as much, which was which was the GDR. So what that sort of meant, uh, basically, for the automotive world and the architectural world, you will hear us discuss, and you hopefully join us uh, next week. So. Yep. Until then, you guys stay mentally mobile as much as you can. <laughs> Will do.